morning and welcome to our online service here at SCC. It's great to have you here. I hope that it's as much of a pleasure for you as it is for me to worship together and to talk to each other through the live chat. Uh, we have a couple of announcements for you this morning. First, it's that OM2 will be meeting at 1245. And if you're unfamiliar with what OM2 is, OM2 is our outreach and missions ministry. And so if you would like more information about that or would like to join us, please contact Bo at ministry at seattlechurch.org. Our second announcement is that Mother's Day is coming up, and we thought it would be a lot of fun to have a video of all of us giving a shout out to our mothers and those special women in our lives, saying how grateful for them we are and how much we love them. And so if you could film yourself or your adorable kids um, telling your, talking to your mom or talking to those special women, that would be great. There will be a link in the description down below um, that will bring you to our Google Drive, and we'll be taking your submissions until May 5th at 9 a.m. So please send us some footage. All right, now let's pass the piece. All right, blessed be your name. Let us bless him in the challenging times and in the joyous times. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. So glad that you've chosen to join us for worship today. Let us prepare our hearts as we hear the word of God. Our scripture today is from Luke 24, starting at verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, 
about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you talking about with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have taken place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself that were in all scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. It is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the longest time, I never understood why on the third Sunday of Easter, we find ourselves back at the tomb of Jesus. After all, Jesus is risen, so why does the lectionary pull us back to such a place of pain and loss. Nevertheless, today in our text, we find ourselves traveling a road that is familiar uncomfortably to everyone. Each of us, regardless of our identity or our circumstance, knows this road. We've walked it. We've lost our way on it. We've left it behind and then returned to it. It is the road to Emmaus, and we recognize it by the words that we say when our feet hit its winding and rough way once more. But we had hoped. But we had hoped that the tumor wasn't malignant. But we had hoped that our husband wasn't cheating. But we had hoped that our child would be freed from addiction and come home. But we, would, we had hoped that the depression would lift, we had hoped that we would keep our jobs. We had hoped that the pandemic would spare our family. We had hoped for a cure. We had hoped that God would answer our prayers. We had hoped that our faith would survive. The words that we speak on the road to Emmaus are words of pain. 
and bewilderment and disappointment and yearning. They are the words that we say when we come to the end of our hopes, when our expectations have been dashed and our dreams are dead and there is nothing left to do but leave defeated and done. But we had hoped. In our gospel story this week, Cleopas and his unnamed companion say these very same words to the stranger who appears alongside them as they walk to Emmaus on that Easter evening. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. You see, Jesus, as far as they know, is dead. The Lord that they had staked their lives on, the Messiah they thought who had changed the world, had died the most humiliating and godless death imaginable. And his promises of a new kingdom have come to nothing worse. Jesus' tomb is empty. His body is missing. The women who loved him and followed him appear to have lost their gosh darn minds when it comes to their stories of angels and gardeners and talking ghosts. How completely everything has fallen apart. But we had hoped for so much. Truthfully, I often forget that the road to Emmaus is an Easter story. That according to Luke's gospel, it happens on that faithful Sunday night. On the very day when we pack churches and put flowers on crosses and sing out Alleluia, the road to Emmaus stretches out ahead of us, offering instead defeat and disillusionment and misrecognition. A reminder that sometimes resurrection takes longer than three days. Sometimes new life comes in fits and in starts. Sometimes seeing the risen Christ is hard. This year in particular, as the COVID-19 crisis continues to cause devastation around the world, I am grateful. I am grateful for the honest witness of this post-resurrection story that continues into Easter evening. When hope is possible, but it's not yet fully realized. I'm grateful that even on the road to Emmaus, the road of brokenness and the road of failure, we find it's a sacred road, a road that Jesus himself walks, a road that honors our deep disappointments even as it holds out for us the possibilities of nourishment and revelation. As I reflect on the gospel for this week, what strikes me so much about the road to Emmaus is that it reveals so much of the heart and the character of Jesus. Once again, I am reminded that Jesus is not who he, I think he is. He's not necessarily who I want him to be either. Who is this would-be stranger on the broken road? How does he respond to the lost when all appears gone? What does he do for the weary and the defeated? Here's what I see. I see a quiet resurrection. One would think that a God who suffers a torturous and unjust death would come back full of vengeance, determined to shout his triumph from the rooftops, determined to prove his accusers and killers wrong, but Jesus does no such thing. As far as we know and we're told, he never enters the temple, he doesn't make a scene. He doesn't appear to the Sanhedrin. He doesn't show up at Pilate's house. He doesn't set the sky ablaze with fireworks. 
Jesus makes absolutely no effort to vindicate himself or to avenge his cruel death. Instead, on the evening of his greatest victory, the risen Christ takes a walk. He takes a leisurely walk on a quiet, out-of-the-way road. And when he notices two of his followers walking ahead of him, he approaches them in a way so gentle, so understated, so mundane that they don't recognize it's even him. Now this is not, I'll admit, what I always want from the resurrected Christ. We had hoped he'd be more dramatic, more convincing, more unmistakably divine. We had hoped that he would make this post-Easter faith easier. Part of the disappointment on the Emmaus Road is the disappointment of a quiet resurrection. The disappointment of God's maddening subtlety and hiddenness. The disappointment of a Jesus who prefers the quiet, hidden encounters to the theatrics we expect and we crave. I also see healing in this story. As soon as Jesus falls into step with his companions on the road, he invites them to tell their story. What are you discussing with each other as you walk along? Astonished by the questions, Cleopas and his co-traveler tell Jesus everything. They share with him the story of their faith, its rise and its fall. They tell Jesus how high their expectations had been for their now crucified leader, a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And they describe their devastation at his death, their confusion, their loss, their uncertainty. They tell Jesus the whole story, and Jesus listens. He hears them out, allowing them the balm of articulation. And then, when they're done, he tells the story back to them. And as he does so, the story changes. You see, in Jesus' retelling, it becomes what it really always was, something so much bigger and so much older and deeper and wiser and grander than the travelers on the road to Emmaus understood. Here's what you're leaving out, Jesus seems to say. Here is what you are missing. And when Jesus tells the story, he restores both its context and its glory. He grounds it in the memory and the tradition and the history of scripture and he helps the travelers to comprehend their place in a narrative that long precedes them, a narrative big enough to hold their disappointment without being defeated by it. And when Jesus tells the story, the death of the Messiah finds itself in a sweeping cosmic arch, one of redemption and hope and divine love that spans centuries and millennia. When Jesus tells the story, the hearts of his listeners burn. For me, the experience of the Emmaus Road always involves a narrowing of my own story. My lens becomes small. I lose all sense of being able to see the big picture. I lose the ability to place my life in a broader, more expansive context, one of God's all-encompassing story. Like Cleopas and his companion on the road, I need Jesus to meet me there, to help me to weave memory and scripture and context and pattern and purpose and history, all of it back together into the tiny narrative that I want to cling to. I need the word eternal and all loving to shape and enliven my words. But we had hoped the story was bigger. 
we had hoped it would have a better ending. Well, it is. And it does. I also notice within the story on the road to Emmaus the freedom to leave. You see, when the travelers finally reach Emmaus, Jesus gives them the option to continue without him. In fact, he makes as though he's leaving, placing them in a position where they have to be absolutely intentional and definitive about their desire regarding him. Do they want him to stay? Are they willing to risk hosting a stranger in their home? Do they wish to go deeper with this man who makes their hearts burn? Or are they content to leave the encounter where it stands and return to their ordinary lives? What, I wonder, would have happened if Cleopas and his companion had simply said goodbye to Jesus on that road? How would their story have ended if Jesus had walked away? They would have missed so much. And the Messiah that they thought they knew and loved would have remained a stranger. They would not have had an experience of intimate knowing with the broken bread and the shared cup. The joy of resurrection would not have become theirs. I am always surprised and often frustrated by Jesus' unwavering commitment to our freedom. He won't impose. He won't overpower. He won't coerce. He will make as though he is moving on and give us the space and the time and the freedom to decide what we really want. Do we want to go deeper? Are we ready to get off the road of our failures and defeats? Are we willing to let the guest become the host? Do I really want to know who he is? Stay with us. That's what Cleopas and his companion say to Jesus. Stay with us. An invitation. A welcome the words a patient Jesus waits to hear. When I look at the story finally, I also see the smallness of things. When Jesus and his companions were seated around the table, he takes bread and he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it to them so small a thing, so small a thing that changes everything. During these hard days of sheltering in place, hearing horrific stories of death and loss and fearing for our futures as individuals and families and communities and nations, it is difficult to trust in the transformative power of the small things. A bit of bread, a sip of wine, a common table, a shared meal, But the Emmaus story speaks to this power, the power of the small and the commonplace to reveal the divine. God shows up during a quiet evening walk on a backwater road. God is made known around our dinner tables. God reveals God's self when we take and bless and break and give. God is present in the rhythms and the rituals of our seemingly ordinary days. What does this mean right now? It means God is in the text that you send to your lonely neighbor. God appears in the Zoom gatherings and the live stream worship services. He appears in the phone call and the greeting card. Jesus is in the stranger that you see across the street when you are walking your dog, both of you smiling under a protective mask. The sacred is in the conversations you have with your stir-crazy kids, the technology that you attempt to master so you can talk to your friends, no matter how far the distance. The loved ones whose challenges 
who challenges you to reframe your story of these days in the light of God's inexplicable provision and love. If the Emmaus story tells us anything, it tells us that the risen Christ is not confined in any way by the seeming smallness of our lives. Whenever and wherever we make room, Jesus comes. But we had hoped. Yes, we had. Of course we had. So very many things are different right now, so different than what we had hoped they would be, and yet he still meets us on that lonely road to Emmaus. The guest who becomes a host still nourishes us with his presence and word and bread. So keep walking. Keep telling the story. Keep honoring the stranger. Keep attending to your burning heart. Christ is risen. And he is no less risen on the road to Emmaus than he is anywhere else. So look for him. Listen for him. And when he lingers at your door, honoring your freedom, but yearning to feed you, say what he longs to hear. Stay with me. Amen. These are the places I was so sure I'd find him. I've looked through the pages and I've looked down on my knees. I've looked to the skies in expectation to see the sun still refusing to shine. Sometimes he comes in the clouds Sometimes his face cannot be found Sometimes the sky is dark and gray But some things can only be known Sometimes our faith can only grow When we can't see Sometimes he comes in the clouds. Sometimes I see me sailor out on the ocean. So brave and so sure, as long as the skies run clean. But when the clouds start to gather, I watch my faith turn to fear. Sometimes he comes in the clouds. Sometimes his face cannot be found. Sometimes the sky is dark and gray. But some things can only be known. Sometimes our faith can only can't see. Oh, sometimes he comes in the rain and we question the pain and wonder why God can feel so far away. But time will show us he was right there with us. Sometimes he comes in the clouds. Sometimes his face cannot be found. Sometimes the sky is dark and gray. But some things can only be known. Sometimes our faith can only grow. When we can't see. Sometimes he comes
comes in the clouds He comes in the clouds Join me in a word of prayer Father God, we know that we need you. We need you in our lives every step of the way on this journey of life. God, I pray that you would guide us on this road from a place of fear and anxiety to a place of hope and joy, from a place where things are lost to a place where things are found in your resurrection. As the disciples walked the road to Emmaus, God, we need you just like they did then. We need you now, God, and I pray that you would come into our hearts this morning, that you would be with us, God, in the power of your resurrection. And I want to invite you into this place, God, as you invited us to your table so that we could receive your life through your presence. God, I pray that your words of grace and love would continue to be with us in our hearts as they lead us on this lifelong journey with you, God. In your name, I pray these things. Amen. Now it's time for our offering. We encourage you to give faithfully. It's your faithfulness that really makes this ministry possible. Uh, you can give by going online to our church website, www.seattlechurch.org, and you can find different ways to give there. We want to thank everybody uh, for giving so faithfully, even when we are not meeting at church. Thanks. Let us praise together by singing, How Can I Keep From Singing?
Señor. 